you kind of find yourself in some peculiar situations. And, and like I said, the woman at the well is a funny one because here's this woman just meeting this strange man at this well. And he looks at her and he says, hey, if you drink of my water, you'll never thirst again. Like, what, what kind of kind of nut job are you? You know, what are you talking about? And, and sometimes I, I kind of think about Jesus in that light, that he's kind of that friend. You know, we've all got that friend that you're kind of afraid to introduce to everyone else because you just don't know what he's going to say. You don't know what he's going to do. Some of you are looking at your spouse. Maybe you married that friend. I don't know. But, but, but anyway, uh, Jesus is that guy, you know, and, and it, it, it reminds me of a guy who, uh, and, and this is not a tale. I mean, this, this type of stuff literally happened in the Bible where they would go to a dinner party or of, of some sort. And, you know, if we were to put it in today's times, maybe one of your friends is in a wheelchair. And it wouldn't be nothing for Jesus to walk up to your friend in a wheelchair and say, hey, why are you in a wheelchair? Get up, walk, you know? And you're like, Jesus, oh, you can't just do that, right? Like, like I cringe just thinking about one of my friends saying that to somebody, you know? And, but that's just how Jesus was, and Jesus could get away with it because he's, well, he's Jesus, right? He is the Savior. And I have a feeling that's exactly what was happening in this story because we have the disciples and everybody's walking up to this pool of Bethesda. And of course, everyone knows the significance of this pool, even in that time. And, and I, I just, I wish, you know, I, I love that, that movie, uh, Titanic, well, parts of it, but I love the part where it, it, it kind of goes from under sea, you know, it has under the sea, and you see all the algae and all that stuff just growing on this old boat under the water, and then all of a sudden the camera zooms in, you know, and then everything, the lights come on, and it's like this ballroom, and the two doors open up, and it's just like you're walking in the Titanic, you know, and, and I love, I mean, I don't know what director or who made that transition, but it was for Kevin Poston. I mean, for, for the rest of my life, anytime I think about history of any sort, and, and, and when I put it in my mind, I, I think about that transition from this old thing to like, imagine what it was like to actually be there. And I do that in my mind in this story, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about this pool of Bethesda, and, and, and I'm thinking about these, these porches that are there, I'm thinking about a lot of impotent folk, folk being there, as the Bible says. A lot of people that are, are crippled and lame and people that need a healing nonetheless. And, 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 and so I'm seeing this and I'm seeing Jesus walking around, you know, and, and, and this is just absolutely where Jesus would want to be. I mean, this is this is the, the wolf in the hit house, right? I mean, if, if there's a place where Jesus needs to be, it's in this place. It, it's where, where he can do the most good in this place, right? And so he's walking around, and no doubt he's probably looking around. And all of a sudden, the Bible says he finds this one man, the certain man, the Bible says, that's been there for 38 years with the same affliction, Right? I mean, we had COVID for not even a year, and it's driving us insane, right? And this man has been going through the same affliction for 38 years. I mentioned, and I'll mention again, I'm not even 38 years old yet, and I'm going to keep mentioning that as long as I can, because, uh, man, I'm feeling older by the day. But anyway, so 38 years this man has this, this, this issue, and Jesus walks upon him, Amen. And he looks at this man and, and, and he asks him that question. Do you even do you want to be healed? And, 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 and instantly when you hear someone's tone of voice and the, the tone of that question, you can't help but think that maybe, just maybe that there was something in, in this man's setup, maybe around his bed, maybe there was something there that kind of proved the point or, or, or was at least alluding to the fact that he had been there a long time and maybe that he had gotten comfortable being there for a long time. Amen? Uh, I, I believe that there was something there. Maybe he was taking advantage of this in some magnitude. Maybe that he had just set up some nice contraptions around to where he could roll around or something. Maybe he was laughing about his situation. Maybe other people had told Jesus this. Maybe this is just one of those things that Jesus knows because he's Jesus. I, I, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, it doesn't really matter something about this situation or something spoke to Jesus to say 
this man has been here far longer than he should have been. And so Jesus looks at the man and he says, do you want to be healed? And it seems like a ludicrous question, doesn't it? Because if you have been going through something so terrible for 38 years, wouldn't you think it would just be obvious that you wanted to be healed? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but uh, there's a lot of times where Jesus meets people and, and it's obvious they need healing and he doesn't stop to take the time to ask them, do you want to be healed? When the blind man comes to Jesus, he doesn't ask him, do you want to be healed? Now, he does ask some different questions sometimes, like do you have the faith and those types of things. But, but what kind of question is do you want to be healed, right? And, and, and it, it just triggered something in my mind that some of us have gotten used to our pain. Some of us have gotten comfortable with our conflict because you can become numb to the nuisance, can't you? You can adapt to your affliction. And I want to tell you that struggles can either be motivating or as we well know right now, COVID-19 can become monotonous, amen, to where it's just a, a typical thing. I, I put on Facebook the other day, I went to the, uh, I, I was going to Starbucks, and, and uh, I got out of my car, walked up to Starbucks, got right to the door, didn't even have to look at the sign that says I needed a mask before I realized I need a mask to get in this store. So then I turned around, I walked all the way back to my car, didn't even open the door until I realized that the mask has already been in my pocket all day. And I was thinking how stupid of that, you know, how stupid I was of that, but then I thought like my muscle memory has already been trained that I can't even get into a, a, a store without a mask, but I have messed this up so much that in my mind subconsciously, I have reminded myself, hey dummy, you don't have a mask, go back and get one, and, and, and I'm just like, man, I'm sick of COVID, you know, and here I am in Christiansburg, right in front of a, 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 a Cold Stone, just fussing at my car about COVID-19, and, and I'm just like, just furious at this, because that's what happens after a time, you get frustrated with your condition, and it just becomes a routine, it just becomes a ritual, and before you know it, you have become acclimated with your affliction. And I believe that there are people that come into churches every time the doors are open that have become acquainted with their affliction to the point that they don't even pray for it anymore. To the point where they feel like it's a wasted breath if I pray for my cancer to be removed or it's a wasted breath if I pray for this affliction to leave me or, or whatever it may be. I love the testimony that our sister gave today. We don't have to leave here the same way that we came. Anytime we come into the presence of God. It is an opportunity for us to lay our burdens down at the feet at the cross and we can leave their chains. That's one reason that I love our Savior so much is that we don't have to dwell in these situations. He doesn't expect you to just sit in the muck and the mire. Matter of fact, He expects you to stand up and ask God, help me to get out of this situation. I need you. I depend on you. Amen. 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 And if you're not careful, your issues can quickly become your identity. You know, the Bible doesn't really give us this man's name. It just says a certain man. The woman with the issue of blood, we don't know her name, but we know her issue. Because she was identified by her issue. There's a lot of friends that you may have that you, you might not even refer to them by their real name. You might refer to them by their affliction. I've got depression, and he calls me all the time. And every time I see his number show up, I think, what has happened today? I, I, I've got friends that need money, and every time I see that affliction, that's what I, I don't think about their name, I think about their affliction, because their issue has became their identity. Now, I don't want my issue to become my identity. I want my identity to be very clear that my identity is not wrapped up in anything that I am. I, my identity is not my profession. My identity is not even my name on this earth. My identity is who I am in Christ. My identity is that I have been adopted into a holy family. I'm part of a royal priesthood. I am the son. I am in that family. And you are my brothers and you are my sisters. We are all part of that family. Amen. Romans, it says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. Amen. You don't have to accept 
fear. You don't have to accept uh, bondage. You don't have to accept all this stress that's happening in 2020. You can accept the fact that God is your Father, and we can cry, Abba, Father. We can cry out to Him, and He will hear our cry. He will be there. His hand is not short. His ear is not turned down. He is still our Father. He's still in heaven. Even in the middle of this pandemic, God doesn't have a mask on His face. God doesn't have to be six feet away from us. There is no restriction. God can still touch. Amen. 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 And I, I, I think it's just obvious, though, that there was something about this man that just did not quite sit right with Jesus when he saw him. And he says, do, do, you, do you even want to be healed? You know? And, and it's just so, I mean, that would be, that would almost be a disgraceful question to ask someone. That had been there for 38 years. What do you mean do I want to be healed? Been here for 38 years. But Jesus knew this man inside and out already. He says, I, I don't know. Do you really want to be healed? Or are you getting kind of cozy in all of this junk that you're living in? Let me tell you, the devil would love nothing more for you to get cozy in your junk. <clears throat> the devil would love nothing more for you to just rest in your bitterness. The devil would love nothing more for you to just get all, all homey in your hate. The devil would love for you to sit there. But it's time that we say, no, this is not where I'm supposed to set up camp. This is not where God intends us to be. And, 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 and I think for a lot of us, we, we, we are humans and we are so good at adapting. Amen? No matter what your circumstance is, we are humans and God has given us a brain, most of us. God has given us a brain. Hey, man, more and more I see this election season, the more and more I wonder about that. But anyway, uh, you know, God has given us this brain, and we are, we are resourceful. We can adapt to situations, and I think a lot of times we do that. We adapt, and, and sometimes we get proud of our adaptions, don't we? A lot of times we get proud of how resourceful we can be, but sometimes in your creativity to adapt to a situation, it just makes the situation go on and on and on and on when God can just nip it right in the bud. Amen? Amen. I, I, I'm reminded of a friend of mine who a few years back, he's got a daughter who's about a year older than uh, Mackenzie. So she's probably about 10 or 11. I guess she's 11. And a few years back, she was in diapers. And he was telling me he, 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 he wouldn't claim to be a handyman around the house by, by any stretch, I don't believe. But he told me he was so proud one day. He said, Kevin, man, I, I had a leaky pipe. Uh, and it, it was dripping a little bit. And uh, I said, okay, well, did you fix it? You know, well, you got, you got like pecs, you got PVC, did you have to cut it? He's like, no, nah, I fixed it a different way. I said, oh, okay, well, what'd you do? He said, it was a, a genius idea. I was like, okay, what'd you do? He said, I went and I got a diaper. And I took that diaper and I put it around that drip. And then I duct taped that diaper around that leak. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't know if I should be amazed or just dumbfounded at how stupid that is. And he was so proud. And he says, and you know what I do? I said, what? He said, about every month I go change that pipe to diaper. <laughs> now, like I said, that was, uh, that was when our kids were younger. But I haven't heard any update on this story, so I'm just going to guess that now with no kids in diapers, he's probably still buying diapers for his pipes. Amen. But I feel like a lot of us come to church with diapers on our pipes, so to speak. I feel like a lot of us are so proud of our workaround. And when we come into church and someone says, hey, how are you? You smile and you say, I'm doing just fine. And in reality, that's a workaround to your situation. Amen. I think a lot of us, when we see things and we got bitterness in our hearts, we try to flush that. We try to go away from it. We try to hide it. We try to conceal it. When you got hate in your heart, you try to conceal it. When you are coveting something else and you try to conceal it or whenever life has just handed you something so bad, whether it be a cancer or a disease or whatever it may be. Maybe you got laid off. Whatever it may be. And someone says, hey, how are you? And you say, I'm just fine. I'm great. You are covering up. Amen. And I believe that's when Jesus looks at you and says, are you done? Are you ready to stop hiding? Are you ready to stop using your work around? Are you ready to come and just confront this with me and let me take this over for you? Are you ready to be healed? Are you ready to be set free? Are you ready to get a job? Are you ready to be healed from this disease or this virus? 
fire, whatever it may be. I'm telling you, I believe that God is sick and tired of us waiting, sick and tired of us trying to hold this down on our own. We are not capable of holding this down on our own. God is supreme in heaven. He has every resource we can ever need. Paul said that he has the supplies that you need that you can never ask and not receive, that God is always there. We have just got to ask him. I feel like that's one of the biggest problems of the modern day church is that we think we've got it all figured out. We come to church and everyone smiles and everyone's happy and everyone is just so gleeful and, and it almost looks like a Saturday night live skit sometimes. Because you think in your mind with all the people in this room, even in this room tonight, that we are going through some stuff. If we were to go each person and we were to open up about what's going on in our life right now, you would tell us some things and we would all be in shock and horror of the things that are going on in your life, the things that are stressing you out, the things that have been on your mind, the things that keep you up at night, the things that you're afraid to tell anyone else, the things that you're trying to suppress inside of your own being, the things that you're afraid to confront, and in an effect you try to adapt to those situations and you try to power through and you try to say I'm strong enough and you try to say I got to keep faith and you're trying to say, i got to be strong. But the reality of the situation is you are at the pool of Bethesda and Jesus is coming by. You just need to lean on Him. You need to give it all to Him tonight. For the longest time, I used to be like, I don't understand how to give it away. What do you mean, preacher? What do you mean give it to Him? I mean, you got to fall at the foot of the cross and you got to break and you got to say, God, I have nothing in me to give. I have nothing left. I am solely depending on You and I can promise You with 100% confidence because I've been there many, many, many times as I'm sure you have too that when you get to that point you will see a breakthrough like you've never experienced before. God will show up and show off in your situation because a lot of times in the, in the time that you need, really need to understand the supply of God is when you need the supply of God. Yeah. Yeah. You can't truly understand the wealth of God until you need the wealth of God. You can't truly understand it. Right. That's one thing I pray about all the time, uh, being a youth pastor at our church. Sometimes I'm talking to these kids, and I'm like, until they go through this, God, they'll never understand it. I can preach it to them. I can speak it to them. I can tell them story after story. But until they go through the fire, mm -hmm. until they go through it for themselves... And the only thing, and, and it's like I pray about this constantly, it's just like God is continuing to tell me you have to prep them. You have to have them prepared. Even though they may not have walked through the fire today, there will be a fire tomorrow that they will walk through. And they need to hear someone's voice. They need to hear someone saying, you can make it, just keep going. Amen. Yes, amen. But how many of you have been through the fire? Amen? How many of you have seen God move when everyone else said there's no way? That's why I love talking to atheists. I've told you guys this. I've told you every story I got probably. But I love talking to atheists. I love talking to people that tell me that God's not real. Because I've been through way too many fires and come out on the other side and without even a smell of smoke on my clothes for you to tell me that there is not a God. I've come through way too many trials that could not be determined to be a coincidence for you to tell me that God is not real. I've seen way too many miracles in my life for somebody to come and try to proclaim that God is not real. I have seen him. I have witnessed him. I have felt him. I have heard him. He is alive. He is real. Amen. 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 I want to tell you tonight, we cannot become comfortable with the work around. Amen. I'll tell you another thing that people get comfortable with is walking in darkness. Amen. I, I've never seen a generation of people that love to walk around Without any knowledge of God. Amen. I just don't know how people do it. We, we had a great Sunday school lesson this morning on the wisdom of God and, and being spiritually wise. And Man, I'm telling you, if there's one thing we're lacking in this country, it is a spiritual wisdom. Amen. Amen. And, and I just don't understand how people, how people do it. I, I probably told you the metaphor before, but it's one of my favorite illustrations to show this. Because I think it, it resonates for me and hopefully it resonates for you too, but... I, I think of when, when my kids were a little bit smaller and, we, you know, the whole process to put them to sleep. Sometimes that would take forever. And, and, and I mean, I, you know, you rock them back and forth and you fall asleep before they do most of the time. And, and then you finally get them to sleep and you think, all right, now i got to make this trip to their bed. And i got to lay them in their crib. And i got to try to make sure I don't wake them up. 
And I remember some nights, most of the time Tasha would do it because she is just an angel, but, but sometimes I'd have to do it. And, and, and I remember sometimes I'd walk up the stairs in, in, in their old house. I'd have to walk up the stairs, and, and you're just praying that you don't hit that step right that creaks real loud. And, and, and so you get up there, and you get up to the stairs, and, and you don't want to just flip the lights on because if you flip the lights on, then it'll wake the kid up, and that's the last thing. That is like the, you just can't have that happen. So, so you go through the room, and, and I can just remember staying at the, the foot of the, or at the door, looking at the crib across, and, and just knowing, well, here we go. Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil, but thou art with me. You know? And, and I can just remember, because most of the time it wasn't too bad, and we had a straight shot, so it wasn't too bad. But I, I know I've probably told you guys this before, but one of the sharpest things the world has ever made, manufactured in the entire world, is the hands of Barbies. I mean, they are so sharp. I mean, uh, like if you ever just don't have a butter knife or anything else, uh, feel free to use uh, a Barbie hand because they would work just fine. Uh, I've shaved with one before. I mean, they're a fan. Of, okay, I haven't done that, but you probably could. I mean, they're so sharp. And I remember a few nights I'd be walking with this baby and just hoping that I was getting ready to get to the crib, and all of a sudden I'd step on one of those Barbie hands. And you know, you know those like cartoons that you used to see where they would like hold their mouth and then they would run up to the top of the hill and then scream as loud as they could and then run back down. That's how I felt. I mean, I just, uh, inside of me, there was just a cartoon character just screaming on the inside. And I'm about to like tear my lip off, biting it so hard, trying not to scream and, and hell out. And uh, I think it was uh, last week, I cracked up so loud. In, in our house right now, we've got cameras uh, up in uh, Kenzie's room. It's just monitors for, for at nighttime and so we can spy on her. And anyway, Anyway, uh, they're up there, and, and the other night, uh, I heard, like, boom, 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 and then I heard, Ow! and I looked at Tasha, and I was like, what in the world just happened? And she looked, and she was talking to Kenzie on the monitor, and she said, I stepped on a Barbie! And I said, yes! Finally! Got some of your own action! Because it hurts! And you know, sometimes I, I think about that illustration about how I'm carrying her and I'm trying to navigate to the crib and it's so dark and there's obstacles in the way. You know, and a lot of times I think that's how people are living life today. If you don't have the lamp, amen, if you don't have the word of God guiding you, then you are basically walking with the lights off and you're trying to navigate this world, trying to navigate all the obstacles. And I've got so many friends that come and they'll tell me, I don't know why I always have the bad job. I don't know why I always get the bad girl. Friend. I don't know why I always get the crazy boyfriend. I don't know why I'm always the one getting the, the, the crazy disease. I, I don't know why I'm always the one getting laid off. All these different things. And ever since I've thought of this illustrate, that's the only thing I can think of is they're walking through life with the with the, the, the lights off and they're just stepping on one Lego relationship and a Barbie hand job and all these diseases. And it's all this victim. And I just want to look at it, Brother Ron, and tell them, you need to turn the lights on. You need to just turn the switch and and open up God's book and allow Him to guide you and direct you. It will keep you away from those things. Amen? Amen. Uh, we were talking about spiritual wisdom. And I truly believe that spiritual wisdom comes from this lamp. Amen? I, I truly believe this is the lamp that, that lights our path. Amen? I, I truly believe this is the thing that guides us. And I believe the Word of God, reading it and praying, I believe that God can instruct you on where to go. In my professional career, I've had many opportunities and many things that have happened to me that I've prayed about and I have seen why God has moved me in this direction and I've seen why God has moved me in that direction. It didn't always seem obvious in the moment but a year would pass and I would look at Tasha and say, can you believe what just happened? Can you? If I would have been there, this would have been me? And, and, and we've always thanked God for those moments but I want to tell you that we have become so comfortable playing the victim, amen, so comfortable in our victim mentality anymore that we are just happy being satisfied sitting by the pool for 38 years so I can play a victim. I don't know about you, but I don't want to play a victim. I don't want to have a victim mentality. I don't want to woe is me. I don't want to live a life of depression. I don't want to live a life where I'm always having to be the overcomer. I want to trust in the overcomer. I want to lean on his perfection. I want to not be a victim, but I want to be able to hold my head up high and know that I I'm a child of the king, amen, that there is power in me, that I can overcome the devil, I can overcome the world. Why? Because I believe in a superior being, Jehovah Jireh. 
Hey, man, I'm, I'm tired of victim mentality. I'm tired of it. Hey, man, we are not to be victims. That is not what God has called us to be. And I believe, I, I don't know this whole man's story, but it sounds like Jesus was putting this man in that boat. Do you even want to be healed? Or do you want to just sit here and wallow? Do you want to be healed? Or do you want to come to church every week with the same prayer request? Do you want to be healed? Or are you just wanting everyone to feel sorry for you? Do you want to be healed? I think, I, I, I truly believe, I know there's some things that we go through for a season. I know some seasons are longer than other seasons. Amen. And I know sometimes God tries us in different ways. I want to tell you, God did not call you to be miserable. God did not send his only begotten son to die on a cross for you so that you could live in misery every day. He said, I come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. Amen. I don't know how many times in my daily prayers when I'm praying and I feel like I'm just I, I just get so depressed about things and, and sometimes I get in the middle of all this junk and all of a sudden that's my prayer. That's what will break out in the posting house. I'll say, God, I know you didn't you didn't set all of this up for me to live a miserable life. You didn't do all this for me to be awful. You didn't do all this for me to just be sad and depressed and, and in this state all my life. You didn't do this to make me sick. You didn't do this. Jesus didn't get the 39 stripes for no reason. I know this is not my destiny. I know this is not where I'm supposed to set up. I know I shouldn't lay my tent here. I know I shouldn't try to make this my home. I need you to help me get out of this situation. That's the prayer we need to have. But too many of us today are happy just settling in our sorrow. Amen. Refuse to be a victim. Amen. Philippians, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He says in Romans, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. The psalmist says, the righteous cry the Lord hear it and deliver them from all their troubles. Amen. He also says in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen. Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them from them all. Amen. So I don't know if you're here tonight and you say, woe is me, and you came in with a chip on your shoulder, and you came in thinking COVID this, and, and the election that, and you came in thinking I'm just so depressed, and I'm so out of it. And I want to remind you that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but our Lord, our Savior, Jehovah, Jireh, our provider, has delivered us from every single one of them. Amen. There's not an affliction that we have faced that has yet to overcome his people. Right, Thousands of years have passed and God's name still reigns supreme. Amen. 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 There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you better believe it's going to take a lot more than a political ideology to put down the name of God. It will take more than a society of, of idiots who are trying to promote a different agenda to put down the name of God. The devil has been trying to shut up the name of God for thousands of years. Ever since he was cast out of heaven himself. And he has failed time and time again. And if you have read the back of the book, you know how the story ends. We will prevail. We will overcome. We will not be defeated. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tired of being a victim. You're a child of God. There is no reason for you to be a victim tonight. Amen. Amen. And, and I love what he tells him in verse 8. So the man gives him the excuse. He says, every time I go to step or I, I go to get to the pool, someone beats me there. And I don't know, like I said, I, I, I'm kind of leaning in a little bit here just with the tone that Jesus is saying here to this story. And maybe this is true. I mean, the man can't walk. But man, 38 years, you would think that somehow, some way, you'd find a way. You ever been in that situation where you just had to find a way? You know, uh, maybe you weren't the best. You know, I... I used to, anytime I played sports, I used to think I might not always be the most athletic, but no one will ever outwork me. Ever. I remember one time I was in Pee Wee football and I came off the field and everybody else's jerseys were dirty and their pants were dirty. 
And I played a pretty good game. But my dad looked at me and he said, why ain't you dirty, son? I was like, I thought I was doing good. I thought mom would be happy, you know? <laughs> and he, he taught me a lesson in that day. You know, I was being too cautious. I wasn't working hard. And, and that's one thing my dad has always taught me. No matter what, you can work hard. You might not always be the smartest. You might not always be the most talented. You might not always be the most educated. But you can always work harder. And I've lived by that. Sometimes to a detriment. Because when you're in my field and you're working with a lot of smart people, i got to work real hard. Amen? <laughs> real hard. And, and, and I, I've thought about this in this story. You, you can't, I mean, when you get desperate enough, there is nothing that will stop you. You know? And, and I can't help but think with this man's situation. How desperate could you have been for 38 years? I mean, if this is me, I'm rolling myself over right next to the pool. And I will lay there every second of the day as long as I can until that angel shows up. And as soon as I see that angel, I'm rolling over into that pool. I, I ain't depending on anyone. I'm going to make a way. Sometimes you got to make a way. I, I remember uh, a place I used to work, uh, we had this thing called Ice Cream Friday. Woo, it was so good. And it's so stupid now to think back, but it was so good then. And every Friday at about 1 o'clock, right around right after lunch, Somebody would go and drive and pick up some ice cream somewhere from the grocery store, just a bunch of it, bring it back and put it in the freezer. And then there would be a mass email that would be sent out, Ron, and it would say, ice cream's here. And then all the nerds would go into the, the kitchen, and it was the nerd herd, we'd say. And, and, and you'd go into the kitchen, and, and everybody's trying to get their ice cream. And, and, and it, it wasn't really good for me and my team because we were so far away. And so by the time we got there, all that was left was kind of like the fudge sickles and stuff like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's ice cream. I'm not going to complain. But it's not the Nutty Buddies, you know. It's not the Snickers. It's not, it's not the uh, Strawberry Shortcake. It, it, it's not the Twix bar, you know, in ice cream. It, it, it's not any of the good stuff. And, and so you're walking, and, and all of a sudden all these guys are coming back enjoying a Nutty Buddy. Know, and I'm just like, I wish I could get a nutty buddy. You know, and I'm walking to the fridge. And, and you know, so I, I got to thinking about it. And I was like, man, you know, the guy comes like every week at the same time just about. I mean, sometimes a few minutes here and there. But most of the time, I get that email about the same time. So I'm just going to make myself useful in the kitchen around that same time. <laughs> and so I go in the kitchen. And I'd be cleaning up pots that weren't even mine. And I'd be standing there, and all of a sudden, I'd see him walk in with all these bags and put it in the freezer. And then I'd see him go over to his office and get down at his desk and start writing that email. And then I would go right to the freezer, and I would open up the door, and I had every option I wanted. <laughs> you find a way, right? Whatever you want, you'll find a way, right? You'll find a way. Well, I said earlier, we are creative human beings. If God gave us brains, you'll find a way. If you want it bad enough, you'll find a way. And that's why sometimes I get so upset with people who have the same problem week in and week out. Some of this, don't get me wrong, I know you can't help. But some of this bitterness that we have in our heart, some of the, let, me, let me tell you something that doesn't get talked a whole lot about at church. Unforgiveness. You know, we, we are really good at saying that there is one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And I agree. That is in the Bible. That sin, it definitely says you, you cannot make it to heaven if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Unforgivable. But there's also a second unforgivable sin, and that is unforgiveness. Because the Bible says if you can't forgive other people, God can't and will not forgive you. I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves about that. Because I'm telling you, I've been in churches, not this church, thank you. But I've been in churches where people get up to sing and half the congregation won't stand up because they don't like the person singing. If you can't stand up when someone's singing the name of God, I don't care who's singing it. I don't care what they look like. I don't care who they are. If someone's singing the praises of God, I can muster up enough strength to stand up and praise God. Praise the name being sung. Amen? Amen. And I've, I've been in these churches. You have too. We, some people make a mockery of Jesus, splitting over stupid stuff, 
Splitting over the carpet color and splitting over uh, uh, just just dumb things. We, we, we make a, a, a mountain out of a molehill. And, and we, 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 we talked about this morning rebellion being the spirit of witchcraft. Amen. And I believe it comes into churches to divide us. Amen. And I'm telling you, a lot of people hold that stuff in their heart. I've been to some of these churches where you can tell a church has been affected. That maybe someone has done them wrong and they are still holding that in their heart. Or, or maybe you've done someone wrong and you haven't asked forgiveness and you still hold that in your heart, I'm telling you, it's time to get it under the blood. It's time to come to the cross and say, God, I know you're coming soon. I want to be ready. I don't want to play a victim. I don't want to wallow in my misery. I want to be clean. I'm telling you, he's coming back for a church, the Bible says. And it's a church without spot or wrinkle or blemish. I'll be the first one to tell you that grace and mercy have saved me. But I'll also tell you that he is not coming back for an anemic bride. He's not coming back for one that is filthy and has spots all over it. He's coming back for one that is forgiven, that it asks for a repentance, and that is living a holy lifestyle. Amen. 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 Hey man, sometimes you've got to make a way. Sometimes you've got to find a way where there is no way. We talked about the woman with the issue of blood. We don't even know her name, but we know her issue. She had this issue of blood, and she had it for many, many years, the Bible says. The Bible also tells us some more details about her. It said that she spent all the money that she had trying to find a cure for her problem. Couldn't find one. According to the law, she could no longer be with her family. She had to be exiled from her family. Matter of fact, she shouldn't even have been in the city. She should have been exiled outside of the city. Any person that would have came in contact with her would have also been deemed unclean. For her to be in that, that proximity of where she was on that given day where she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, it was unlawful for her to be there, but she had to find a way. Sometimes you just got to find a way. And this woman had got to her wits end. She got to the place where she said, I know I, I shouldn't be here. I know that this is against the law. I know I can't do this anymore though. I know I've spent every dime I've got. I know that I've been away from my family for years now and I know I cannot continue to live this life. I have to find a way to Him and thank God on that day. She pressed through the crowd, the Bible says, and she touched the hem of His garment. And in that moment, in that very moment where she touched Jesus, Jesus stops everything and says, wait a second, someone touched me. And the disciples look at Him like He's crazy and they say, yeah, a bunch of people are touching you right now. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. I just felt virtue leave me. I want to tell you that if you're here tonight, and you're going through a problem you can touch the hem of his garment you can really touch him to where virtue will fall in your lap you don't have to settle with your circumstance you don't have to wallow in your wilderness you can allow God to intervene I think about the leper at the bottom of the hill bottom of the mount after the sermon on the mount you guys know that's one of my favorite stories that's the greatest sermon ever preached ever will be preached Nothing can match it. You think I preached long? That was a, a few days he preached, so just so you know. But he preached this great sermon. And at the end of it, he comes down to the bottom of the mountain. And there is the living symbol of sin. A leper. Should not have been there. But he said, I have to have you, Jesus. Yeah. And he looks at Jesus and he says, will you just touch me? Yeah. I know if you just touch me, I'll be made whole. I'll be made clean. And I think that story gets overread so much because it is such, that story changed everything. Because up until that time, if Jesus was to touch an unclean, if any person was to touch an unclean, they were deemed unclean. This was the first time in history, in Jewish history, that an unclean person touched, or a, a, sorry, a clean person touched the unclean. It's the first time. It would be as though one of us would go walk up to someone who was just dripping in COVID and touch them. Everyone. I hope he has mask on. I hope he's sanitized. I hope he's prayed up. And I can just imagine the group of people around him thinking, did we just see what we thought we saw? And Jesus touches him. He didn't have to. Understand that. He didn't have to touch him. Matter of fact, I think it's in that same chapter or the next chapter. The centurion comes to Jesus and he says, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. 
And in that same instant, Jesus healed the man that was in his house. Didn't touch him, but healed him. He didn't have to touch him. He wanted to. Now, I want to tell you tonight, Jesus doesn't have to touch you, but he wants to touch you. Amen? Jesus wants to see a smile back on your face. Jesus wants your heart to be so joyful. Jesus wants you to have a life that is abundant life. Jesus doesn't want you to be stressed out right now. I know it's the middle of 2020 and all this junk going on. Jesus wants you to have a smile on your face because you know that he is your Lord and Savior. And that if that is your Lord and Savior, there is nothing that can shake you. All hell might be breaking loose around you. Everything may be going nuts around you. But you can still say, God, you are my provider. God, you are my resource. God, you are my Savior. God, you are my everything. Amen. I want to tell you, I, I, I better close. Musicians, will you come so I'll shut up? Amen. I want to close with this. Sometimes you have to step out of your comfort zone. Sometimes you have to find a way. Uh, not too, too long ago, uh, I, I had this issue with my knees. And I, I probably told you guys this before too, but uh, I had this issue with my knees and I went to the doctor and uh, they, 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 uh, I, I really, I just had no idea what it could be. I, uh, one of them started swelling up, and uh, then the, the other one started swelling up. And I, I thought maybe I was overcompensating for this one, and that, that, that's why that one swelled up. But the doctor said, no, they didn't think that was the case. And so they, they looked at it, and one day uh, he told me, the doctor did it. I, he, they ran some tests and some blood work and everything. We thought it might have been rheumatoid arthritis there for a while because that kind of runs in my family a little bit. And, you know, all these different things we thought it could be. And then he sits me down, Ron, and, and he looks at me and he says, uh, you all right, son? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, this is years ago. And uh, he says, well, I just want you to know that we think we know what it is. I'm like, all right, great. What is it? He said, we think it's lupus. And I said, okay, all right, what do we got to do? He said, well, we're not sure. We're not sure. He said, but uh, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Great. What we got to do? He's like, well, we're, we're going to do another series of tests. We'll know for sure after that probably. And, and uh, he's like, so we'll, we'll schedule the appointment. It'll be in a few, probably about a month and a half or two months from now. I was like, all right, cool. No big deal. So I walked out. Mind you, didn't have an ounce of an idea what lupus was. Didn't have a clue. Didn't think to ask because I was just a young kid idiot, right? You know, you, just, you would think now, being the much wiser, mature man that I am, that you would at least ask what lupus is, you know? But I didn't. And I'll never forget, I got home, and we lived in that little one-bedroom apartment uh, above my in-law's garage, and I, I'll never forget this. I sat down on the couch, turned the TV on, and there was a news broadcast, back when you could trust the news, and, and the news came on, and a reporter said, so-and-so celebrity, I can't remember the celebrity, it was a woman, has died of lupus. I turned the TV off. And I said, you got to be kidding me. So then I, I did what any good person would do. I go to uh, uh, one of the medical sites online, which you shouldn't do, and I look up what lupus is. And I was like, oh, I got that, I got that, I got that, I got that. I got, that. I got lupus, it's fine. We can cancel the test. I've got lupus. And I remember Tasha calling. She asked me how the appointment went. I kind of downplayed it a little bit, you know. In my mind, I kind of thought, it's probably not bad. It can't be. I'm too young. I, I, there's no way. No way. And so, long story short, during that, I don't know, two-month window that I had to wait, I got invited to go preach at a lot of churches. You know? And uh, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes I guess that was around vacation time, you know, or something. And... I would go to churches, and my knees would be so swollen. I mean, so swollen, I would have to wrap them with braces. And, and I had metal metal straps on both of my knees, and if it wasn't for those, I would have been able to walk. And I can remember I would get, I would walk, and in this church, this is one of the churches I came to preach at. I can remember I would get up behind the pulpit, and I would, I would kind of limp behind the pulpit. And I would preach a message, and... And, you know, it's really difficult sometimes. And you've probably experienced this maybe if you're witnessing to somebody about something. But in the back of your mind, you're struggling with the thing that you're witnessing about. You ever had that happen? So I've been preaching a message to a congregation saying things like, God can heal you. And 
no sooner than that would leave my mouth in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why hasn't he healed you then? Woo. And I, I, I remember preaching a message. I, I went to Corners View one, uh, one Sunday. And I don't know why, that would just vividly sticks out in my mind. I was praying for people around the altar, and, and I just, I could hear this whisper, and I, I can't help but believe it was the, a whisper from the enemy, and they were telling me, you know, why hasn't he healed you, Kevin? He can heal, all right. Well, let's see it. And I was getting bitter. I mean, bitter. So, I remember that I was scheduled, I, I, I think it was, I was scheduled to go have uh, the scan on a Tuesday. And that Sunday morning, I woke up and I prayed, just like I had every day. And it's like God spoke to me. And he said, Kevin, I don't want you to wear any braces today in church. I thought, that sounds ridiculous. But I don't want to do it. And I was finding my way. And so I, I, I made sure the braces were off. I went to church. I went through the motions. I prayed at the altar. And I said, God, all right, I did what you said to do. Here I am. Heal me. Nothing. Nothing. I don't know that I've ever been more disappointed in God than I was that Sunday morning. You ever been disappointed in God? You don't have to answer that. But I was. I was furious. And I remember we went home and I sat down and I just started beating myself up because that's what you do. What, what is wrong with me? What sin do I have in my life that I don't know about that's causing God not to heal me right now? What, what am I missing? What am I missing, God? Because that's just your natural instinct. So, time for Sunday night church. Thank God for Sunday night church. We, we go to church and I decided, I said, I'm, I'm going to try again. I'm not going to wear it. And it, it was just a normal Sunday night service. And I think my dad gave the altar call and I stood somewhere around here and I lifted my hands. And I remember hearing a testimony from Sister uh, Barbara Hagen. If you've ever heard her sing, man, she sings. Sings so good. She gave a testimony one time about her daughter and how sick she was. And that she, in order, I, I think her daughter was on the verge of dying maybe as a baby. And she went to a different room and, and she just began to repeat all the promises of God. And she said that she really believed that is what healed and saved her baby. So here I am at, at the altar with my eyes closed, my hands raised, and I remember that testimony. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remind God of every miracle that I've ever known about. So I went from Genesis to Revelation. I said, God, you created the heavens and earth in six days. You can heal me. God, you split the Red Sea. You can heal me. God, you tore down the walls of Jericho. You can heal me. God, you tore up. Uh, you killed thousands of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. You can heal me. And I just went down the gamut. I, I said, God, you poured down fire on Elijah's sacrifice. You can heal me. God, Elijah and all the, prop, and all the other prophets and all the miracles that were performed in their lives. And I went through all that. Jesus went through all of Jesus' miracles. Every blind man he healed. Every, every, every leper I could think of. Everything that I could think that he did. Lazarus and, and everything. The, the, the woman with the, the dead son on the way in the middle of the funeral. And the woman with the issue of blood. And the centurion. All these people. And I'm just standing up there reminding God of all these things. And when I could not remember one more miracle out of the Bible. I went to real life. God, I remember when Sylvia Vaughn came to East Rafford Church of God in a wheelchair and she left Rome. I remember. God, I remember reading a book by Smith Wigglesworth where a man had half a foot and you told the, the man of God to go buy him a shoe that would have fit his club foot and tell him to put it on. And he put it on. I have seen the newspapers from that time that talked about this rich man who had a club foot who led a, a man of God in his house and he put on the shoe and his foot grew into the shoe. God, I remember hearing a story about Perry Stone's grandfather who preached where my parents were from in a revival. And there was a kid who didn't have an eye in his socket. And a woman with her kid that didn't have that eye in his socket was walking down a sidewalk and they saw a revival sign. 
And the men saw it and they were making fun of this, this king. They were making fun of the revival. And they told the woman, you should take your son there. Maybe God will heal him. And they were laughing and they made it a mockery until she did. She took her son to that service. And in that very service, Perry Stone's grandfather laid his hand on that man, on that kid. And an eyeball formed in that kid's socket in that very service. I have talked to a woman that was in that service that saw it. And I'm standing at the altar praying and reminding God of all these promises and reminding God of all these miracles. And I simply ended it with this. God, if you can do all that, I know you can heal me. And I kid you not, there was a man, Rocky Huff, one of my best friends to this day, was crawling over the whole time laid his hands on my knees. And as soon as his hands touched my knees, every ounce of swelling, every ounce of fluid that was in my legs immediately just sucked right up. I don't know where it went. It went into some supernatural place, I guess. I don't know. But what I can tell you is that a man that walked in there stumbling and fumbling and having to hold on to pews and having to make sure he was okay getting to the altar, danced his way around the altar all night and walked out and has never had a problem since. I called the nurse the next day. I knew her and I told her, I said, I don't need your scan. I don't need any of this anymore. She said, Kevin, we need to go ahead and go through with it. I understand what you're saying. And about $1,500 later, I was cleared of lupus. I said all that to say this. If God can heal me, he can heal you. If God can touch me, he can touch you. And if you're here tonight and you say, Kevin, I'm in the middle of some of the greatest storms I've ever been in. I want to ask you a question. Do you, do you even want him to heal you? Do you even want him to take you out of it? Or are you just happy settling in, in your sorrow?